1961, a Florida man named Clarence Earl Gideon was accused of breaking and entering a pool hall and stealing a few drinks and jukebox coins. Too poor to afford a lawyer, Gideon asked the judge to assign him one, but the judge refused. Therefore, Gideon was forced to defend himself and then found guilty. While in prison, he wrote this five-page letter to the Supreme Court from his jail cell, requesting an appeal. The High Court agreed to hear his case, leading eventually to the historic 1963 Gideon v. Wainwright ruling that made criminal defense for those who can't afford it a legal right. This is a very important case. It's a very fundamental case. It's important to thousands and thousands of poor litigants uh, throughout, the, throughout our country. Gideon was retried with an assigned lawyer and found not guilty. Fifty years later, about 80% of criminal defendants can't afford a lawyer, and our corrections population is ten times bigger. As a result, the public defense system is largely failing the poor. The San Francisco Public Defenders Justice Summit marked the 50th anniversary of the Gideon ruling here at the city's public library. We attended to learn about the state of criminal justice for indigent defendants. I would just say the words indigent defense and people's eyes would glaze over. Karen Hoopert, author of Chasing Gideon, a new book about the U.S. public defense system, gave the keynote address at the summit. It was a mandate to uh, provide public defenders, but there was no funding for it or no direction about how states should go about doing that. So you have the right to a lawyer, you don't necessarily have the right to a good one. Filmmaker Don Porter, a former private attorney, directed Gideon's Army, a new HBO documentary about public defenders in the Deep South. The overwhelming majority of people in this country who are facing criminal charges are getting a public defender. There's not a lot of, I get to pick who I want. And that's part of the issue, the difference between a poor person's experience and a wealthier person's experience. You, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that there is no civil rights struggle uh, going on in this country that's more important than the struggle to make sure that poor people have lawyers. Jonathan Rapping is the founder of Gideon's Promise, a training program for public defenders in the South. He is also a longtime public defense attorney. Um, in many of the places where we work, you really wouldn't even know that Gideon versus Wainwright existed. Those lawyers frequently are saddled with incredible caseloads. They frequently don't have resources to investigate cases and to hire experts. And so for a lot of these lawyers, although they come into the work for the right reasons, they become um, lawyers who are forced to simply help process people through the system, every pressure in the system. I would walk to this drug court and the Halls were just crowded with people, you know, people who are meeting their attorneys for the first time in the hallway, and you're just like, oh my God, how could this attorney be meeting this 12-year-old kid in the hall and then go into court and tell him to, you know, plead guilty to a drug charge? You know, it's just, it's, it was shocking. Industry standards for public defender caseloads were set 40 years ago. A Mother Jones analysis found that if public defenders were to adhere to the standards, they would need more time than actually exists in a year. They'd each have to work an estimated 3,035 work hours, which translates to a year and a half, and that's if they don't take a single day off. Every time I read about the caseload maximums, I want to scream. When I was a private lawyer, I probably worked on seven matters at a time, and I was working all the time. I don't know how you're supposed to juggle 150 felonies and a number of misdemeanors at the same time. I don't, I don't know how you're supposed to do that. The industry standards were set in 1973 by the National Advisory Council on Criminal Justice Standards and Goals. They recommended that public defenders take on a maximum of 150 felonies a year, and that's if felonies are the only cases they're representing. Many in the field already consider these standards unrealistic and outdated. Rapping explains what they actually mean for public defender workload. If a person were to work 300 days out of the year, that means they could spend two days with each client. You or I, if we were charged with a serious crime and we went to a lawyer with $20,000 and that lawyer said, for that $20,000, I will give you two days this year. We would walk out, right? But that is the accepted standard for poor people. But I really think that there's a culture of indifference um, and in uh, believing that, so what if 
so-and-so didn't do this crime. They did something else. Police round up populations of people from certain communities, and they dump them into a criminal justice system. There is then a conveyor belt that whisks those people to sentencing, and then with draconian sentencing laws, judges lock people away for long periods of time. You know, we saw um, Maurice's story, which I think happens a lot. She's referring to Maurice Caldwell, who was wrongfully convicted for second-degree murder in 1991. He spent 20 years, seven months, and six days in prison before being acquitted. Maurice spoke at the summit about his experience. By me being from the, the uh, projects where I'm from, and me having conflicts with, you know, several and different uh, individual officers that, that brought me to the interest of a murder investigation. Maurice's conviction was based on the error-riddled testimony of just one neighbor. Maurice's family, wary of the public defender system, hired a private attorney who bungled the case and has since been disbarred. While in prison, Maurice took his case into his own hands. You know, uh, Montel Williams, uh, Ophel Winfrey, you know, I wrote to everybody that, you know, that could hear my story, like 60 Minutes, Dateline, 2020, all them people. So when I found out that Jeff Adachi opened a, a public defender office that deal with innocent people, I wrote to that office. You know what I'm saying? And from that office, they gave me a lawyer. It was Adachi's public defender office in San Francisco that responded to Maurice's pleas and picked up his case. They transferred it to the Northern California Innocence Project, leading to Maurice's eventual exoneration. But despite its successes, the San Francisco Public Defender Office is still underfunded, like most others in the country. Think about the resources of the prosecutor's office. Do they have an investigator? Of course, they have an entire police force. Let's look at the other side. On the other side, you have a public defender's office, which may or may not be statewide. It could be countywide. They have different sources of funding. In Louisiana, uh, public defenders are funded by parking ticket revenue. So in one year where they didn't print the parking tickets, they didn't have enough revenue, they had to stop paying the public defenders. But by not funding public defense, we don't fund the one piece that actually is meant to slow the system down, to slow the belt down, and make sure we take a look in the mirror and ask, are we doing this consistently with American principles? Very first time I ever walked into a courtroom in New Orleans, and it was just, there were people everywhere. And then all of a sudden, a judge called a name, and there was no voice. And the judge turned to the orange jumpsuits and says, is Mr. So-and-so here? And the man says, I'm Mr. So-and-so. And the judge said, where's your lawyer? And he said, I haven't seen a lawyer since I got locked up. The judge said, well, when did you get locked up? He said, 70 days ago. And then the judge said, fine, sir, sit down. And he went on processing people. And what shocked me more than the fact that a man had been locked up for 70 days without a lawyer was that no one in that courtroom was phased. Experts propose a number of different solutions to alleviate the public defense crisis. Mm -hmm. There are also public defenders, like in Miami, who've stood up and said, we're not taking any more cases. We're just not going to do it anymore. We refuse. So we have to rewire the mindset of prosecutors. We have to rewire the mindset of public defenders who, have, who many have come to accept that processing people through the system is OK. And we have to rewire the mindset of judges who preside over these hearings day in and day out. And also get caught up in moving dockets, um, and that that's more important than ensuring that justice is done. You know, I think it would be really interesting to have um, minimum standards for what you should do in each case, right? What if we said you have to meet with your client <laughs> before their hearing? And that, by the way, would be revolutionary for in some places. You have to have met them and spoken to them, you know, for an hour before their first hearing. You have to do the minimum amount of investigation. You have to speak to the police about their case. Just that, which is, does not seem, you know, really revolutionary. Only when people understand that any one of us, right, could be one paycheck, one lost paycheck away from needing a public defender, only then, I think, will there be a political will, uh, a public will to push for real reform. Mm -hmm.